This is Doomblade, a game you've likely never heard of before. Iceberg Interactive, the producers of Doomblade, sponsored me to make this video. They asked me, this guy, to make a video for them. All right, but you asked for it. If you're curious about this game from the title screen alone, then use my link in the description to check it out on Steam. By the way, using this link in particular lets them know that I sent you. Please help me make a good impression, I'm hanging on by a thread here. For context, this isn't going to be your typical sponsor video, where I say some pre-scripted lines and then show generic gameplay. I've value honesty above all else, so in this video you're going to get the good and the bad. Got it? Anyways, the game begins with this rather impressive looking start screen, and after spending five seconds trying to get my controller binding set up, I quickly found out that this game doesn't like me, and refuses to accept any of my inputs. It clearly registers that a controller has been connected! Why would you accept the buttons, and why are the defaults left blank? <sighs> whatever, I guess I'm on mouse and keyboard. The game begins with a loading screen that takes six years to finish, and lands you in the starting area. I'm asleep. After hearing a creepy voice off to the right of the screen, our protagonist wakes up to reveal their wibbly wobbly limbs and a killer hourglass figure. Damn, Ethan! Wandering to the left, we discover a hidden zone with a strange unreadable tablet, and to the right lies progress. If you decide to ignore progressing further, then you get to do more reading. Mind the carnivorous plants. The atmosphere here is impressive. So far so good. Travelling onwards, we get some unobtrusive tutorials and a couple of tentacle zombies. Are you friendly? Blah. Further up again, up some stone ramps, past some more zombies? We'll call this one Jim. You aren't very smart, are you? He's a little slow. We find a fire-breathing face hole embedded in the wall, which turns out to be a very square digestive tract. Descending into the bowels of this literal smooth stone beast, we find, well, to be honest, exactly what you expect. It's a sword. Tied up with flimsy-looking chains held together by two stone carvings that seem to be playing an unwinnable game of tug-of-war. We saucily slink our way up to the hilt, making sure to press as much of our body against it. Get your mind out of the gutter! And voila! Doomblade acquired! Roll credit! We did it. Tutorial survived. Fun fact, we will never, for as long as we live, not even once, swing this blade like a normal pitch black sexy void tentacle thingy. Apparently, our teeny little noodle arms just aren't strong enough to wield a piece of metal twice the size of our bottom heavy body. And as such, we're going to need to find a different way to approach combat. I was thinking maybe running away, sitting in a corner and crying perhaps? Ooh, maybe we could- Okay, never mind, we're just going to hurl our entire bodies at whatever happens to be on the screen. This is fine! After committing genocide on creatures that literally just accept their fate and only walk forward towards their inevitable demise, we survive our first encounter, beat the snot out of a weird looking bone box, collect a bunch of bones that are just lying around on the floor that we apparently need for some reason. Hi, Editor Wimby here, I still don't know what these are used for. We break the final seal, jam our sword into the ground, which apparently works as a save now, and then begin the game. Now equipped with the ability to yeet ourselves at anything living and breathing, it becomes clear that our most important use for this power is to go up, which is exactly why I spent the next 34 seconds abusing these spiky boys to reach this heart thingy. I should mention that the movement feels fantastic. If it wasn't already obvious, using enemies as a way to move around the map is by default a good idea. Much like the bash mechanic in Ori and the Blind Forest, it just feels good. It's fast, it's freeing, and it satisfies my ever-present need to murder the innocents. Murrow Studios actually did quite a good job of making sure that the base mechanic of this game feels natural and intuitive, so I gotta give them props for that. Progressing onwards to the left, I came to quickly realize that despite still not knowing what they're used for, I do still wish these bones were more attracted to the player instead of requiring you to walk over them to pick them up. I mean, have you seen this figure? Of course they should be attracted to me! Moving on, we find what looks like a giant door with a pattern lock on it, just like my Samsung, and after trying to brute force it for too many attempts, we get locked out and have to find the princess in another castle. Assholes. After wandering around for a bit and eventually finding where we're supposed to go, we stumble into the LOUDEST VIBRATING ROOM IN THE GAME! Oh! It's a map! Great! Now I can pinpoint the exact location of all my non-existent brain cells. Heading left into the next room, we get to stab the earth again for good measure, and proceed into mushroom land. Please be mindful that half the shit in this area is prone for explosion and doesn't care about your feelings. After dying a bunch and suffering through another six years of load screens, I discovered that the save mechanic functions something like out of the NES. If you die, it's like someone just yoinked out the cartridge and then puts it back in. It's an exact reset. None of your progress matters, and the only thing you lost was time. This as a design choice isn't inherent inherently bad, but it's flawed, and could use a few tweaks. I'll add this to my list of little suggestions at the end of the video. In the meantime, however, we finally made it through hell itself without getting eviscerated, and get to stab the earth one more time. Love doing that. And into the next room lies nothing but a bunch of bombs. OH GOD! And then the arena begins. Take out the floaty boys and survive until Mr. Chargy here reveals his tenter blobby before slashing him to merry hell. Phase 2 begins with twice the number of enemies and the exact same solution, and Phase 3 just has these weird centipede thingies with a mini-boss health bar that I didn't even notice 
notice until I started editing. Even if the combat here was simplistic, I'd like to point out that it was intuitive. I knew where all the weak points were, understood mechanics within an instant, and could play out each phase with minimal confusion. This is very good practice. With them dead, we get more loud humming and a dash ability. It's these type of upgrades that make a game a Metroidvania. In the next room, we don't get to save, but instead travel to the void, which desperately looks like it's ready for a boss fight, and pick up a key. I wonder what this is used for. I completely forgot. Anyways, after heading back to the main room and actually saving this time, we backtrack some more, cross the gap with our new ability, and talk to a cool looking dude managing a totally harmless fire pit, and finally progress back to the lock I'd forgotten about. After inserting the key and having the passcode laid out for us as clear as day, the path opens up and we collect a trinket that does god knows what. We ignore the save because I'm blind and have the attention span of a gnat, chase after and attack these weird conveyor belt turret thingies, insta-kill one of them that has the shield protecting it, and travel at 0.25 the speed of light only to get hit within the next 30 seconds, and discover one of our distant relatives has been trapped in a form of stasis and is unable to die. Wow, that's dark. It's at this point that the story begins to make more of a personal turn. You know that you're not common around here, and this is the moment you find out why. You're just a resource. The only question is... For who? Progressing a little further, snagging up some extra bones and surviving a literal minefield of bullets on one HP, we collect another heart fragment, get lost and start wandering off in a random direction, find a bunch more bones, a scythe that we can't collect yet, get lost some more, and then proceed to delete all of that progress in a single instant and get sent back all the way here. Do you see the problem with the save mechanic yet? Anywho, with our brains now slightly more wrinkled from all this knowledge, we re-enter the passcode, remember to save this time, collect some more bones, retrace our steps, I almost dead guy, head right this time into the path we haven't explored yet, find another save point along with this weird looking void tentacle thing that we should probably leave alone. Okay, yeah, we're leaving. Psych! Uh -oh. It heads into the void, entirely of its own volition, and despite the creepy teeth peeking out from under its head cloth, this thing is actually our first introduction to fast travel. Well, at least we know what the void is used for. Anyways! As we retrace our steps once more, we try heading back left this time and seeing where it leads us. Wow, it's another save point. Why does this look like the start of a boss fight? Yep, that's an arena! This one is much more centered around mid-air combat, which is definitely confirmed given how the floor is slightly electrified. Wave 1 is shield bots that get one shot from behind, wave 2 is double that with just more shield bots that get one shot from behind, and wave three is... Okay, yeah, you get the point. Once again, the combat is simplistic, but very understandable. It helps that the movement is so fluid and intuitive, as it keeps the fights flowing like one seamless dance routine. In the next room, we get more loud humming and unlock the power to power. I, I can't say I'm disappointed, but I also have absolutely no idea how this thing works. Oh! That's how. And this is a dead end, great! Getting lost a little and stumbling across this weird looking voodoo doll thing, we get lost some more, find another heart fragment locked behind a puzzle, backtracking to the main room and recollecting this heart fragment, we learn that there's probably an ability that lets us travel through solid surfaces, though to be honest I still have no idea what it is. We get lost again and find our way back to the save point with the jellyfish, and it's at exactly this point that I have no idea where to go! I started looking for places that I hadn't explored on the map yet, and stumbled across this weird tablet looking thingy, still no idea what it does, searched around some more and found a piece of paper. After running around like a headless chicken, I ended up in this location again and realized that I could probably pull off a sequence skip here and ended up somewhere I'm not supposed to be. Oh god, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be here. Please don't kill me. Ah! And then I got greeted by another six year loading screen. Okay, well, if I'm honest, despite my criticism, this game is still a lot of fun. There's a ton of content here that I didn't even scratch the surface of, like there being seven entire biomes, each with their own unique boss fights, a bunch of mini bosses, and over 50 unique collectibles, all with their own little tidbits of lore. And since the game is only just released, they value genuine feedback, so here are my immediate takeaway points. First off is the save mechanic. Unlocking doors, gathering unique collectibles, killing mini bosses, and snagging new abilities should all force a save state, but lose you bones if you die. There needs to be a punishment for death, but not for progress, and at the moment, those two things are switched. Next is to immediately establish a use for bones. Like, what are these used for? Unless I miss something in the early game, or if it's revealed later on, right now there is no reason for me to be collecting them, and I find that to be a missed opportunity. Immediately indicating what they're used for at the very beginning of the game is also a fantastic way of motivating the players to keep progressing. This also has the added effect of making death something that you want to avoid, as opposed to just being a major inconvenience. Finally, optimizing things like load screens aren't a must, but they're definitely a welcome change. Even spicing up a load screen with tidbits of lore or amusing dialogue would be a great way to stop players from feeling like they're just stuck in waiting mode. And also, 
like to be able to use my controller, please. If you want to see Doomblade for yourself and see all the content that I haven't covered yet, then use my link in the description to visit their Steam page. And thank you to Iceberg Interactive for being my sponsor. Now, go outside and do something productive, damn it. Unless it's late, in which case you should probably sleep. I'm gonna go, like, make pasta or something. Bye!